Hello, I'm Mark Sidwell. I'm the author of the New Culture Forum's latest book, The Long March, How the Left Won the Culture War and What to Do About It. And I'm going to read the first chapter. Chapter 1. Gramsci's Ghost. An odd melancholy haunted the Conservative victory in Britain's 2019 general election. Prime Minister Boris Johnson's new majority of 80 MPs was not just decisive, but overwhelming. Even the most cynical Westminster watchers admitted that a fresh decade of Tory power likely lay ahead. But there was a spectre at the feast, a dead Italian Marxist called Antonio Gramsci. As the Tory party and its supporters raised their champagne flutes to the collapse of Jeremy Corbyn's labour and its hard left agenda, their hearts were kept down by fear that this victory was superficial. Beneath the surface, a far more important war had already been lost to Signore Gramsci's ruthless disciples. This fear explains some of the opinion pieces released by prominent figures on the right in the days after the conservative landslide. For these authors, the sweeping rejection of their political opponents at the ballot box was cold comfort. The left was not in office, but it still held power. In a notable example, historian Andrew Roberts wrote in The Telegraph, calling for Mr Johnson not just to focus on Brexit or the economy, but to secure future election victories by committing to fight the battle for British political culture, a battle he argued that all of Britain's Tory Prime Ministers since Margaret Thatcher had ducked. It was time, he said, for a Gramscian countermarch through the institutions, liberating one after the other from the grip of the left. And Mr Roberts was not alone. Mark Wallace, then executive editor and now chief executive of the influential Conservative Home website, wrote in The Sun that ministers should steel themselves for a bumpy ride and warned that legacy Labour appointments had left quangos and commissions stuffed with political enemies. The Johnson government appeared to agree. Number 10 quickly announced that it would not be sending ministers to appear on the BBC's Today programme citing its bias against them. Rather than acting as the politically unassailable force it appeared to be on paper, the new government acted as if it was living in occupied territory. Douglas Carswell, the former Conservative and UKIP MP, wrote an opinion piece on the 1828 website, which again cited Mr Gramsci by name and spelled out the same message in stark terms. If the Conservatives last week defeated Marx, as personified by Comrade Corbyn and John Macdonald, their next battle must be against Gramsci, as personified by that army of guardian Easter quangocrats whose long march through our institutions currently means that we get a left-wing agenda in almost every sphere of public policy-making, irrespective of who we elect. Even some intellectuals writing for publications of the left agreed. This January, the philosopher John Gray wrote an essay for the New Statesman entitled Why the Left Keeps Losing. He too spoke of the contrast between Mr Johnson's unassailable power in government and his weakness before the wider culture, claiming that British institutions as a whole remain vehicles of progressivist ideology. Mr Gray again invoked Mr Gramsci arguing that the mismatch between Mr Johnson's ambition and such institutional progressivism places a question mark over whether he will be able to secure the conjunction of political power with cultural legitimacy that Antonio Gramsci, one of the most penetrating 20th century political thinkers, called hegemony. Who and what are they talking about? Mr Corbyn's Marxist views were scrutinised and debated from every possible angle through seemingly endless hours of pre-election coverage. But to the general public, neither the idea of a long march through our institutions nor Mr Gramsci means anything. And yet, the fear of his influence was still giving some of our top political thinkers sleepless nights, even after shooting dead Mr Corbyn's bright red fox. This book is an attempt to lift the veil on Mr Gramsci's legacy in British politics, to interrogate why he provokes such fear, and to explore how justified that fear really is. <laughs>
We will look at his ideas in more detail later, but the essential doctrine driving Gramsci and other so-called cultural Marxists is simple enough. A successful revolution, they claim, requires not just the seizure of political and economic power, but also conquest of the cultural sphere. Culture, everything from art and entertainment to religion and morality, social and sexual norms, is, they argued, a sort of factory, one that mass produces consent for our political way of life. Therefore, to undermine free market capitalism in the West in favour of socialist revolution, cultural Marxists called for like-minded revolutionaries to seize the means of cultural production. In practice, much of culture is mediated through institutions, from the Church of England and the BBC to schools and universities. Recognising this, the cultural Marxists also spoke of a long march strategy. Over time, their allies would march through one institution after another, capturing it for their revolutionary views. From then on, these captive institutions would help to spread an insidiously collectivist culture, which undermined the capitalist, individualist status quo and built a new consensus for communism, or at least some sort of democratic socialism. It was an argument which both sides in the Cold War took seriously. The CIA supported cultural projects in the other direction, notoriously backing the anti-Stalinist left-wing magazine Encounter and subsidising an animated version of George Orwell's Animal Farm. The abstract expressionist movement also received secret support from the US government for decades. The spooks at Langley were eager to show the world that America's system could produce a kind of art which smashed through the restrictions of the Soviet's socialist realism. Still, put this way, the ideas of cultural Marxism seem both extreme and abstract, perhaps even distant, one more anachronism left over from the era of mutually assured destruction. In Britain, for anyone under the age of 30, the threat of Soviet communism is no more than a historical curiosity. Equally, there are those who look at the idea of a culture war and see only an irrelevant sideshow. Boris Johnson did win the 2019 election, arguably without the support of the institutions of cultural power. How much influence, then, do such institutions really exert? Worse yet, is cultural warfare not just an irrelevance, but actually a diversion from the political battlefield? Wouldn't Mr Corbyn's labour have been a stronger opponent for the Conservatives if it, if it had only set aside identity politics and appealed to its heartland with straightforward policy proposals to make their lives better? To begin to understand why a historian like Mr Roberts was nonetheless taking the ideas of the cultural Marxists seriously and worrying about them so much even as Boris Johnson took power, it helps to review a few facts about British politics in 2019, beginning with the other Red Wall. The surface chatter of the election was about Labour's Red Wall in the Midlands and the North, which duly crumbled in the face of Mr Johnson's campaign. But political observers with an eye on the longer term worried about a different Red Wall, one stretching not across particular geographical constituencies, but between university campuses, and state stool and skit. But political observers with an eye on the longer term worried about a different red wall, one stretching not across particular geographical constituencies, but between university campuses and state school classrooms. The world of British education is dominated by Labour voters. Mr. Roberts complained in his Telegraph article. Why are over 85% of university lecturers left-wing? And indeed, political monoculture seems to exist across all areas of the education system. Before the 2017 general election, the Times Educational Supplement conducted an online survey, which found that 65% of primary school teachers and 72% of secondary school teachers were planning to vote Labour. In both groups, the percentage of Tory voters 
failed to even reach double figures. A similar survey of UK university staff in 2019 for Times Higher Education found 54% planning to vote for Labour, 23% for the Liberal Democrats, and just 8% for the Conservatives. It is not, of course, the private political opinions of teachers and lecturers that concern Mr Roberts. It is the culture created within institutions dominated by a single way of thinking and the influence that may have on students' political leanings. After the 2019 Conservative victory, Twitter account at Election Maps UK released an analysis showing how Britain's political map would have looked if only 18 to 24 year olds had voted. Instead of Mr Johnson's 80 seat majority, it found that Labour would have secured a staggering 438 seat majority. Labour's commanding lead in the youth vote is a relatively recent phenomenon, only really opening up in such a striking fashion in the last two general elections of 2017 and 2019. It may be a short-term effect caused by Corbyn mania and fears over Brexit. But as John Gray put it in his New Statesman essay, their support for Corbyn is also a byproduct of beliefs and values they have absorbed at school and university. According to the progressive ideology that has been instilled in them, the West is uniquely malignant, the ultimate source of injustice and oppression throughout the world, and Western power and values essentially illegitimate. And for conservative strategists, this is too unnerving a prospect to ignore. If these young Labour voters do not change their views as they age, future elections will be unwinnable for the Tories. In such a climate, it is also no surprise to find opposition parties voicing their wholehearted enthusiasm for reforming the voting age downward. Many more examples could be drawn from across our major institutions. In the established church, the BBC and the civil service, progressive ideals of a more equal society through government intervention are in the ascendant and set the terms of debate. The political gossip site Guido Fawkes recently investigated the relative funding and airtime of groups lobbying for increased state spending and those in favour of less spending and more free market solutions. The groups arguing for higher spending had 40 times more funding and 37 times more staff. Over a week they were quoted by the national media six times more often. But to really understand the concerns of Conservatives about a Gramscian takeover, we must look beyond the nexus of Labour support among faculty and students, or even the ideological leanings of other major institutions, to the behaviour of the Conservative Party itself. In 2019, the late Sir Roger Scruton, then Britain's most famous living philosopher, was accused of racism and drummed out of a government appointment by a Twitter hate mob, whipped up in the wake of an interview for the New Statesman. George Eaton, the magazine's deputy editor, who conducted the interview, posted a photo of himself on Instagram, which he later deleted, in which he was drinking from a bottle of champagne. The accompanying caption said, The feeling you get when you get right-wing racist and homophobe Roger Scruton sacked as a Tory government advisor. Later, the full transcript of the interview revealed that Sir Roger had been the victim of selective quotation on Twitter. The new statesman apologised, and he was reappointed as co-chair of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, which he had been leading before the media storm. The damage, however, had been done. What mattered was not that the new statesman had gone after a Tory, such an aggressive attack was uncharacteristic of the magazine under Jason Cowley's editorship, which has tended toward more thoughtful contributions, like the essay by John Gray cited above. But it was, after all, still the house journal of the intellectual left. What the Scruton scandal laid bare was the ineffectiveness, and even complicity, of conservatives as the attack landed. <laughs> 
within five hours of the accusations being laid against him. Sir Roger was sacked as chairman of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission by the Conservative Housing Minister, James Brokenshire. In the intervening hours, prominent Conservatives had thrown Sir Roger under the bus, using his plight to polish their own anti-racist credentials. Johnny Mercer MP said of his dismissal, let's not take our time. George Osborne, former Chancellor and current editor of the Evening Standard, called Scruton's remarks bigoted and also called for his head, asking on Twitter, how can Downing Street possibly keep Roger Scruton as a government advisor? Danny Finkelstein, a Tory Lord and Times columnist, saw Mr Osborne's tweet and responded succinctly, I agree. The Scruton affair was shocking because it revealed a Conservative Party running scared, desperate to prove that it measured up to cultural standards set by the left and unable to defend even one of its most remarkable minds from a cultural storm whipped up on flimsy evidence. As Sir Roger put it himself in a public statement after the New Statesman apologised, I am grateful to the New Statesman at least for this, that these distressing events have awoken me to the true moral crisis of the party to which, despite everything, I still belong. The crisis was not just moral, however, but cultural. Tests of our character and moral courage arrive in moments of weakness, not of strength. And this extraordinary episode revealed the weakness of political power in the face of a cultural attack, when even a sitting government and a former chancellor failed to stand up for their own allies. It reveals more than lack of character. It reveals a cultural force able to humiliate and put to the test the highest in the land. It was gutless of party grandees not to stand by a man who had devoted his life to arguing for their view of the world. It also proved that it is not enough for conservatives to win elections. A culture hostile to conservatism had the power to force the government and its fellow travellers either to risk their own ruin or to sacrifice one of the best friends they had. After such a moment, the idea that there is an ongoing culture war in this country seems foolish. A Britain where a conservative government gives over Roger Scruton to the mob is a Britain where conservatism has already been culturally defeated. Sir Roger's death earlier this year provided an opportunity for Mr Johnson to set out his stall as a Tory Prime Minister who would act very differently. His response to the news was to tweet, R.I.P. Sir Roger Scruton. We have lost the greatest modern conservative thinker, who not only had the guts to say what he thought, but said it beautifully. But as we have seen, such defiance is also accompanied by defensiveness, as in Mr Johnson's unwillingness to put up senior officials for certain BBC interviews. And his policy programme has already been criticised for the concessions it makes to the left's free-spending, interventionist agenda on issues ranging from the environment to the NHS. The test of the new Conservative government will not be the content of its tweets, but whether it can actually carry off some Conservative policies. The experience of life under Theresa May's premiership does not offer hope. In particular, a much less well-publicised event in 2019 makes plain the scale of cultural defeat that Mr Johnson's new government is facing. That event was the publication of new statutory guidance on relationships and sex education by the Department for Education. Again, this is a case where the actions of conservative politicians produced an outcome, here a change of policy, indistinguishable from that which might have been expected if the government was in the hands of their opponents. In 2016, Conservative Education Secretary Justine Greening announced that she was considering making sex education compulsory in English schools, and it was near the top of her intray. Neil Carmichael, the Conservative Chair of the Education Select Committee, told the press he was pleased 
that Ms Greening was carefully considering mandating this. Despite a few protests, as the trial balloon was floated in the press, the policy was not shot down. Instead, there was much approving and eminently reasonable talk of the need to update the old guidance, so that it would be able to take into account new technological issues such as sexting. By 2017, compulsory lessons on sexual matters had become conservative policy. Relationship education was to be mandatory in primary schools from the age of four. Sex education was to be mandatory in secondary schools. While parents can still withdraw their children from sex education, schools are expected to do their best to talk them out of doing so, and there is no right to withdraw children from relationship education. The new guidance would apply to all free schools and academies, previously at liberty, to go their own way. Last year, the statutory guidance was published, and the reality of this well-meaning policy began to emerge. Among much else, every state school must now punish anyone caught saying that girls and boys might prefer different things. The 2019 guidance states, schools should be alive to issues such as everyday sexism, misogyny, homophobia, and gender stereotypes, and take positive action to build a culture where these are not tolerated and any occurrences are identified and tackled. Boys won't be boys, at least in the playground, or else. The new rule is absurd if its logic is carried through, and we must hope that common sense will save schools from the worst of its mischief-making potential. But the deeper point is not the nature of any particular rule. From now on, the state has been empowered to rule over the intimate instruction of the nation's children, an instruction that will be shaped according to whatever theories the state chooses to endorse, however absurd. Again, when a conservative administration is the agent that permits such outcomes, the culture war is no longer in contest. It has been lost. It is hard to know whether the lobbyists and civil servants who pushed this illiberal policy to the top of the Secretary of State's intray understood the long and shadowy history of forced education on sexual matters by the state. As we will see, the conquest of institutions often happens more by accident than by conspiracy. But the card-carrying conservatives who let it through evidently neither knew the ambitions of cultural Marxism nor appreciated the simple danger of placing such power in official hands. In fact, compulsory sex education has been a Marxist dream since at least the early 20th century. In 1919, the Hungarian communist Jorgi Lukács, as deputy commissar for culture, instituted a sex education program with the aim of overturning so-called bourgeois Christian sexual morality. Mr. Lukács was, along with Mr. Gramsci, one of the founding fathers of the idea of cultural Marxism. It is through the influence of the Frankfurt School, to which Mr. Lukacs was connected in its earliest phase, that cultural Marxism has had such enormous influence in the West. The Frankfurt School's fascination with cultural power and the politicization of sex has led, through the chicanes of post-Cold War history, to a Tory government outlawing the idea that girls and boys aren't the same. It has also produced the Conservatives' current predicament. And yet, and yet the ideas now ascendant in our institutions are not the doctrines of economic revolution that inspired the Long March. Socialism and even communism have become newly fashionable, despite the millions of lives ground to dust by their long histories of failure. But the ideas occupying our institutions are more concerned with cultural than economic control. These cultural commissars search out thought crimes. They police language, pay gaps, and patterns of representation in the workforce. Diversity will be celebrated. The author Ben Cobley has given this new culture of control a name. 
the system of diversity. Boris Johnson has won political office, but the long march through our institutions has ended in a triumph for the cultural Marxists. And while the Marxist dream of a socialist economy has been held back, this cultural triumph is still a defeat for conservatism. One of the great challenges of Mr Johnson's premiership, and one of the great questions of the next decade for Britain, is how much this defeat matters, and what to do next. That's the end of the first chapter. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to read more, there should be a link below, and you can also find a free PDF on the New Culture Forum's website. If you email the New Culture Forum, you can order a hard copy. Thanks so much for listening.